Hello, I'm Robert Llewellyn and welcome to a special podcast takeover episode from my good friend Quentin Wilson. Now, as some of you may know, Quentin and I have launched the Stop Burning Stuff initiative to address the growing issue of misinformation on EVs and clean energy. To support the campaign's mission, we're bringing you a Stop Burning Stuff podcast series dedicated to fact-sharing and myth-busting. Now, we hope you enjoy it. And don't forget, if you'd like to join us and help fight the FUD, all the links to sign up are below. Like everything electric? Then you'll love our fun-packed Everything Electric Expos around the world. Next up, we're in London and Harrogate. Remember, energy and transport professionals go free on the first day. Welcome to another Stop Burning Stuff podcast with me, Quentin Wilson. And today I'm going to be talking to Dr. Ewan McTurk of Plug Life Television, who is an electrochemist and battery engineer. And Ewan, like me, has been driving uh, EVs since 2009. So we're, you know, that doughty band of, of early adopters who went through that whole journey of these cars that, that you know, were, were, were doing only 50 miles to one charge and stuff like that. Um, and, and Ewan did a PhD on next generation lithium chemistries at St. Andrews and Oxford. So everything you ever wanted to know about EV batteries, he is your man. So let's let's begin, Ewan, with that, 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 that first and very obvious myth that we hear so much is that EV batteries don't last, that you need to replace them every sort of four or five years and it costs the price of the car. So tell me about the longevity we're seeing from these first gen batteries. Hi Quentin, so I'm kind of living proof of this because uh, I have a Tesla sitting on the driveway that dates from 2015, it's clocked up 130,000 miles. And I mean, I've only known it from about 90,000 miles old, uh, but I've not seen it degrade its range any since then. I reckon it has lost at most 10% of its original range versus when it was new. So it still does an easy 200 plus miles per charge. So, you know, that that is um, based on a battery pack from 2015, which is based on a cell chemistry from the early 2010s. If we have a look at the chemistries that are coming out of labs today, or should I say the, the chemistries that are coming off of production lines and going into electric vehicles today, there have been further improvements in that rate of degradation, reducing that even further. And that combined with greater understanding of how to manage a battery, how to keep it at its optimum temperature, not just cooling it to wick away heat before it can cause any kind of damage, but also uh, heating it to its optimum temperature, not just if the weather is particularly cold outside, but as it's about to approach a rapid charger so that it can take on maximum power possible. So actually, we've, we've learned quite a lot about how not just cooling the battery can be good for it, but heating it strategically at the right time. And all of this adds up to very conservatively the estimate that we would see 300,000 plus miles lifespan out of modern electric vehicle batteries. And in fact, if we want a, an accelerated aging test, we should have a look at the Ember electric intercity buses that are running between Dundee and Edinburgh and Glasgow and back on one charge, uh, round trip Dundee to Dundee. The oldest of those buses have clocked up over 650,000 kilometres on battery power alone. And apparently their batteries are, the state of health of them, in other words, the, the capacity they have today versus when they were new, is somewhere in the high 80s. So yeah, these batteries are not degrading anywhere near as quickly as the, the early naysayers would have you think. And it is all down to the fact that the battery chemistries we have on electric vehicles are a different breed, not just in terms of the exact chemistry, but the quality of production and the quality of the way that they're managed versus the batteries that we have in smartphones, laptops, consumer electronics in general, and some of the more kind of poorly built e-bikes and hoverboards that have been causing issues. Um, it's, it's a totally, totally different game. Yes, it's lithium ion, but there's a lot to read into underneath that title. So just to be clear then, as an electrochemist who's, who's done a PhD on, on battery degradation, you're saying that the, the reasonable life expectancy of, of a modern uh, lithium ion battery in an electric car is up to 300,000 miles. 
Oh, I mean, that's being completely conservative. I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if they go over that. I mean, if you look, for example, at, um, at Tesla, they've claimed for a while that they have a one million mile battery. And in fact, some of the latest chemistries that they've been working on with Jeff Dan, uh, who is a, or the research group of Jeff Dan, there's more than just the, the one man, there's some very talented electric, electrochemists in that group over in Dalhousie University in Canada. They've worked with Tesla for many years now, and they claim that they've developed a four million mile battery. Now, admittedly, that was cycled very conservatively, and it was a, a little cell at lab scale. It wasn't a big battery pack at, you know, at a commercial scale, but the underlying electrochemistry of that shows promising signs of being able to scale. So we'll get even more lifespan. And we're looking at basically the battery pack outlasting the car. These days, with modern electric vehicles rolling off of production lines, if you don't manage to get the battery to outlast the chassis, you are either living in a very dry climate that doesn't get any salt and grit on the roads uh, and degrade the chassis that way, or you have done something spectacularly wrong in the way that you've designed that battery. But we've got so much experience now, and by we, I mean the, the automotive industry, of how to design a battery properly, that the odds of that kind of early degradation uh, are, are quite slim by today's standards. I think the, the outlier, the exception to this rule, is the very first Nissan Leaf. Yeah. So they did something clever with the battery chemistry. It didn't have cobalt in it, um, or, or if it did, there was hardly any, um, which is, is good from an ethical perspective. But unfortunately, that chemistry wasn't particularly uh, temperature tolerant. And there was no thermal management system, so it didn't actively cool itself with air or water. Or, or yeah, I mean, it wasn't sort of air cooled, was it? Even the, even the early Mitsubishi's and Peugeot Ions and Citroen Z Zeros had air cooling, but those early Leafs didn't, did they? No, no, and this was the the big downfall of the Nissan Leaf. The Nissan Leaf is borderline mechanically indestructible. And that's why when I got my Tesla, um, which dates from the days when Tesla was still trying to learn how to make a car, they were very good at making batteries and motors, but not so much at making the rest of the car. So, you know, in terms of reliability, still better than any petrol car I've had, but it's the silly things that will, will go wrong with it on occasion. Um, but the point is that I kept my Leaf uh, partly because I knew it would just be indestructible and dependable and reliable. And it has been. Uh, and that's been all over the place, that leaf. is It'll, it'll do cross-country journeys if you really want it to. You just need to charge it more often because it is an older one. But the problem with the leaf is that the, the battery pack doesn't have that thermal management. And it's yeah. never had thermal management, despite buyers shouting at this and pleading with them, please, for the sake of 500 quid per vehicle, put in a proper liquid refrigerant system. And that means that these batteries will last so much longer. But, yeah, the original leaf did have degradation issues, and that was exposed on Top Gear. Um, I think it was Paddy McGuinness was was trying to get a, a very heavily degraded Mark One Nissan Leaf to do a, a Bolton Grand Prix or something like this, and had to kind of charge it halfway through because the range was down to like 30 miles per charge. That was probably the worst example that they could find of the worst example of electric vehicle of course, for battery degradation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let, 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 let's just understand why this myth about battery degradation is so embedded. It's still there. You still see people. I had to tick an MP off on Twitter who was saying that they only last five years and you've got to keep replacing. And I don't want my constituents to, to be poor and cold. Um, why don't more people know about this? Is it, is it have we failed in our messaging? Has the industry failed? Because if you're so emphatic about this, um, and and, and 300,000 miles is, is longer than most combustion engines will last. And certainly they wouldn't have that, that 90, 95% efficiency. Um, why are we, we, we not knowing this more, more broadly? Honestly, I think quite a lot of the blame lies with uh, mainstream journalism from what I've seen, because there's just not been that much effort to educate themselves on the reality of the matter or to, if they do know the reality of the matter, to educate the public on that because it obviously kind of fits a certain agenda, I suppose. And what we've, we've seen is just this continuous um, kind of peddling of, of these same old misconceptions that come up again and again and again. But also, in terms of the members of the public, um, if you've never had an electric vehicle before, but of course you've had a mobile phone, you've had a laptop, you've had a, a hoverboard or something like this, you'll have seen how quickly the lithium-ion battery in that degrades and dies because it's badly managed. It... Um, pushes the voltages higher than an electric vehicle would on an individual cell level, which means that it degrades faster. It doesn't keep them 
cool, uh, which, as we've just discussed, causes issues with degradation. Nissan found that out the hard way. Um, you know, and also you'll tend to find that some of the, the current draw, for example, can be a bit more extreme, um, particularly on some more recent examples like vapes. Um, you know, they'll, they'll push very high C rates. In other words, the power being drawn from it versus the energy that that, that cell contains. So, um, you know, an electric vehicle, it's a very, very casual existence for a lithium ion cell. But in some other applications, it can be quite extreme. And there's constant exposure to high temperatures and high voltages and so on. And then people conflate, um, you know, your, your consumer electronics batteries, which also are just poorly made in terms of the electrochemistry and production lines and so on, in comparison to electric vehicle batteries. They conflate those with electric vehicle batteries and assume, well, this phone behaves in this manner. So this electric vehicle that also has lithium ion batteries will behave in this manner, too. It's not true. So I think that more, well, certainly um, mainstream journalists need to be actually kind of delving into this properly and having a look at the likes of the um, the Tesla High Mileage Club forum. And there's other EVs that have done very high mileages too. I mean, a, a perfect example um, is there was a, a, an original Renault Zoe, so 22 kilowatt hour Zoe, um, which has been doing the rounds in Turkey as a taxi. So, you know, fairly hot climate. Um, and the, the thermal management on that is just redirecting the air conditioning over the battery pack so it blows on it. To, to cool it down. That's nowhere near as good as a liquid-based thermal management system. Again, this thing was into kind of six figures of, of kilometerage, it would be in this case, rather than mileage. And the battery health was still very, very high. Um, and this was a few years ago this was reported now. But the point is that even the older, more kind of rudimentary electric vehicles, your Zoe's, your BMW i3s, etc., are still going the distance. And we need to be shouting that from the rooftops because if these older EVs could do that, then the new stuff that's coming out is going to be even more capable of lasting even longer for two reasons. One, the chemistry is better and also the battery management is better, but also two, the battery pack is bigger, but the amount of power required to do your kind of daily EV driving duties, like for example, 20 kilowatts roughly to sustain the vehicle at say 60 miles an hour on an A road, that's still going to be the same, but the battery capacity is bigger, which means it doesn't need to work as hard yeah. to do that, which means it's degrading less. So it's just getting the pictures getting better all the time. Let's talk about um, repairability. Will we come come to a stage where we can take these packs to pieces and change change modules? Uh, it's already happening. So there are certain third party providers who are either developing um, repair processes, and it's, it's quite common for um, for some members of, for example, Hevra, the Hybrid and Electric Vehicle Repair Alliance, of which Cleveland EV is probably the, the jewel in the crown is the most well-known. They even have mobile mechanics who've yeah. Yeah. visited my house on many occasions. So um, yeah, there are, there are some companies who could potentially drop out the battery pack, do proper kind of diagnostics on it, replace a faulty module because most electric vehicle battery packs are made up of little building blocks yeah. and that all kind of fit together. So you don't need to trash the entire battery. You can just replace part of it. Uh, alternatively, they can swap in a replacement battery pack entirely. If the cells have degraded to the point, like kind of universally degraded, it's not just like one or two have, have gone before the rest of them. If they've degraded to the point that, yeah, okay, this is not any, it's no use for me anymore. It's not giving me the range that I need then your options are either sell it to someone who needs a shorter range. There's quite a lot of very old EVs that have ended up in, in retirement in Orkney, uh, where there's very small islands and very small commutes and so on, and they, they live there very happily. And it's also a nice, cool climate as well. So it worked out very well for those original Nissan Leafs we mentioned earlier. Point is, however, that the other option you've got is to upgrade the battery. And again, there are companies who not only would take, for example, an, an original Nissan Leaf with its 24, well, it was 24 kilowatt hour once upon a time battery, now heavily degraded, and swap that out for, say, the 40 kilowatt hour battery from the new Leaf. Uh, there's also companies who I can't disclose at the moment, but there are, there are very talented people working on aftermarket battery upgrades, which would not only give a boost in capacity versus what I've just mentioned, but they would also hopefully introduce proper thermal management where it's required. And that means that these otherwise mechanically perfectly intact, indestructible machines because there's so little to go wrong with them. And aluminium we'll keep... bodies in a lot of cases. <clears throat> well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's not going to rust. You know, that's that's a solid base to keep going. And this will allow these electric vehicles to keep going. And I can tell you now that if 
the UK market decides, oh, no, we'd rather have the latest shiny thing. There are plenty of other right-hand drive markets that these vehicles will be exported to with those um, third-party battery pack upgrades. And in fact, we're seeing quite a lot of this happening or, or the beginnings of this happening in Australia and New Zealand, where, I mean, Australia has finally got on board with renewables and EVs and is, is you know making up for lost time in a, a spectacular way. But New Zealand is an underserved market where they're heavily reliant on Japanese imports. Japan has not been as big on electric vehicles, apparently because there's so little off-street parking and so much of the communal car parks are actually these very futuristic uh, kind of robotic elevators. You drive the car on and then it takes it up and then parks it somewhere. So the uh, the act of plugging your vehicle in when it's in one of those robotized car parks is actually quite difficult, which is why hybrids have been more popular in Japan than electric vehicles. There is a trickle of them available, but in terms of picking up the scraps and importing those, New Zealand is struggling. They could easily change tact and go, okay, what's Britain fallen out of favour with? What's you know, what's a bit old hat by their standards? Okay, we've developed an aftermarket battery pack, or we know someone else who has. We'll just import the lot, stick it all together, and you're ready to go. And in terms of importing secondhand electric vehicles from the UK, that's something that's already happening in Tasmania as well. So um, yeah, that's that's these vehicles will keep going and they will have very robust, reliable, happy lives elsewhere if we decide that we'd rather have the latest shiny thing. But there's actually, surprisingly, also a market for doing this here too with taxi drivers. They quite like their old Leafs, apart from the battery starting to degrade a wee bit. So they are actually you know, chapping on the door of these companies and saying, can we have this battery pack upgrade? Can we have this battery pack swap? Yes, we could buy a shiny new vehicle, but we like this one. We trust it. We know it works. But this is a moment, isn't it, in, in, in the history of, 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 of the car where we're looking at something that's that's got a much, much longer life expectancy than a combustion car. And as you quite rightly say, there are so few moving parts, so there are so few few few, few component failures. And if you can can improve, upgrade the battery so it can do 500,000, 700,000, a million miles, then it, it it's a car that virtually will last forever. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I mean, there's, there's a very strong chance that, um, you know, you would have to as I say, replace the chassis before you'd have to replace uh, the, you know, the battery or the, the motor in many of these vehicles. And in fact, that's why uh, actually until very recently, until the most recent kind of glut of secondhand EVs that became available because all of the kind of company car leases ended at the same time after three years of the Tesla Model 3 being on the market, etc. cetera, um, as recently as 2022, if someone got a bit throttle happy and wrapped their electric car around a tree, there was a fierce bidding war over the battery pack and the motor. And that would inevitably end up going to people who retrofit classic cars to electric propulsion. So even if these vehicles have clocked up considerable mileage, people know, people in the know, know that those batteries are in good condition, that motor is in good condition, that can repower a cherished classic vehicle or uh, a niche vehicle, a heavy duty vehicle of some description. So that um, you know, repairability, Ewan, is, is, is important on a number of levels, but not least the insurance as well, which is now being a big issue for EVs. And insurance companies are, because they don't understand the technology, are just, even with a small dent on a, on, on a battery pack casing, writing the whole car off. So if we can establish this, this, this aftermarket, hopefully with, 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 with cooperation from the OEMs, we can lower insurance premiums by making those batteries repairable after accidents. Oh, easily, yeah. And it's not just a case of making them repairable, it's making insurance companies aware that they are already repairable. And it incre- I think there's, there's quite a lot of onus on insurance companies and the repair workshops that they work with, whether it's in-house or third party, to get the skills required to do that. It's it's lazy of anyone to, you know, to sit back and say, well, we don't know what we're doing with this technology, so we're just going to jack up the premium. No, don't do that. That's just silly. You know, if you want to stay in business, if you want to be relevant, you know, this is your this is actually your business. It is your responsibility to get that training, to get that knowledge. And there are people out there who can help. And for, for what it's worth, there are one or two insurance companies who are starting to look seriously into these requirements. They are reaching out to people in the know in an attempt 
to to get this understanding. Yes, it's high voltage electronics. Um, yes, it's high voltage electricals as well. I should say, um, you know, and there is there's extra concerns about batteries if you've been in a, a massive, massive crash, and if the battery itself has been physically damaged, which, to be honest, would need to be a horrific crash because it's the best protected part of the vehicle and apart from the passenger. Written off anyway, yeah, completely. No, exactly. But to be honest, there's so many, as you say, you know, uh, there'll be a small shunt and uh, some insurance companies will write off these vehicles. That just means that these retrofitters that I mentioned earlier and these kind of second-life battery pack builders are just laughing their way to the bank because they're like, excellent, that vehicle's only done a few thousand miles. We know that battery's in great condition. And we know that that kind of crash just doesn't damage a battery. So, yeah, we will buy that off you for super cheap. And um, you know we'll stick it into this energy storage system. But, in fact, such was the kind of frantic bidding war over used EV batteries until we started to see this this large supply on the second-hand market that as recently as 2022, according to the fantastic analysts at Circular Energy Storage, uh, we shout out to Hans Eric Mellon, who's a friend of uh, everything electric, fully charged and stop burning stuff. Um, so as recently as 2022, used electric vehicle batteries from crash salvage vehicles, etc., fetched up to twice what they cost to the manufacturer when they were new. Yeah, I mean, I've seen them on eBay, you know, £10,000 for a, a, a Model 3 battery pack and and, and £6,000 for a, even a Leaf 24 kilowatt pack. So, yeah, the, the, the aftermarket is, is very valuable. Let's let's move on to fires. This is another very, very, very um, embedded myth that, you know, you're, you're more likely to catch fire in an EV than a combustion car. Tell us how, how nonsensical that is, Ewan. Uh, very. Um, if we have a look at the statistics, uh, an electric vehicle is between 20 and 60 times less likely to catch fire than an internal combustion engine vehicle. And that's based on statistics from Sweden and from the US. Uh, other countries will tell you pretty much the same. It'll be somewhere within that kind of ballpark. And then also within some of those statistics, uh, there are some important considerations. So, for example, Sweden saw the same number of electric vehicle fires year on year. Now, I think this was 2021 to 2022. If it wasn't, it was within a couple of years of that. Anyway, the point is same number of of, of vehicle fires, electric vehicle fires, but with an increased number of electric vehicles on the road. So actually, the odds of your electric vehicle catching fire were decreasing as the vehicle park, the vehicle fleet was increasing. And the other consideration is I've already had a dig at e-bikes and hoverboards and so yeah, on. Yeah. Um, great in principle, but there are too many that are badly designed and badly manufactured and are just not safe. Chargers as well. Um, oh, God, yeah. yeah. The, the charger is a, a, an issue with them as well. If you buy cheap, you potentially buy fatal with e-bikes and hoverboards. So you need to make sure that they are properly made, big brand, you know, reliable products. Because quite often those, those uh, statistics get chucked in with electric vehicles. Yeah. So yeah. And it's a totally, totally different type and quality of manufacturing. It's military quality for electric cars, vans, buses, etc. Not so for your, your cheap, nasty, you know, bought it somewhere online, um, you know, kind of hoverboards and e-bikes. So it's important not to confuse those two. And then the other thing about electric vehicle fires is, um, if I remember a recent podcast with EV Firesafe, uh, there was a, a fantastic t- a statistic in there. Something like 40% of electric vehicle fires don't actually involve the battery. And in one scenario, there was an entire building burnt down around the electric car and the battery didn't catch fire. The battery was fine. But now we're starting to look at batteries that aren't even flammable. So yes, we've been using lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese, oxide, for uh, you know most of the um, you know most of the, the 2010s, and we're still using it today for long range electric vehicles. But NMC, if you manage it properly, is perfectly fine. But if you do something really stupid, like drill straight through it when it's fully charged, yes, it's going to very quickly vent hot gas that catches fire. But we're now starting to see lithium iron phosphate starting to be offered in. In fact, yeah, the best selling electric vehicles in the UK have LFP options. So that. Last year was the Tesla Model Y and the MG4. Additionally, BYD's electric vehicles, Tesla Model 3, Maxus electric vans, etc. And, and electric buses like Embers, they use LFP. Now, why and is that important? Just explain that LFP doesn't have cobalt. It doesn't. It's less um, likely to have thermal runaway, correct? 
Correct. So not only is it more ethical, because there's no cobalt, there's no nickel, it's basically lithium plus rust and a bit of fertilizer, if you look at the raw materials. But also, yeah, you could drill straight through it when it's fully charged. And some versions will vent hot gas, but they won't catch fire. The reason being that the oxygen within the LFP, that's your lithium iron phosphate, it means oxygen, that's more tightly bound to that structure than it is in NMC. So there's not as much oxygen being released, which means it is less inclined to catch fire. And I've seen some amusing videos of people having at them with flamethrowers and all sorts, trying to get them to catch fire. They're just not interested at all. And um, you also kind of compare that to the latest state of the art, which is the BYD blade cell, uh, which BYD has in the electric vehicles that you can buy in the UK today. You drill straight through that when that's fully charged. The surface temperature doesn't even reach 60 degrees C, no gas, no fire. The video that they did that compared an NMC drill test to uh, a BYD blade LFP drill test, about 39 seconds into the video, if I remember correctly, you will hear the sound of an anticlimax of a little drill going through a cell, but not actually uh, getting anywhere with it. You know, just there's no fire, there's no gassing or anything. And it's just this kind of little squeaky noise as it goes through the cell and that's it. So you could properly total one of those cars and it would be, from a fire perspective, perfectly safe. But, you know, battery chemistry continues to evolve. We're starting to see sodium ion becoming available in electric vehicles in China. That, again, is not interested in catching fire. Uh, And there's other chemistries on the horizon that, again, either are non-flammable or vastly reduce the odds of flammability, uh, including with um, new manufacturing techniques for NMC, which make it behave a bit like a BYD blade cell, which is is quite clever. But I won't go into the details of that. The point is that flammability is very soon going to be um, something of a a non-issue as we move towards these more advanced chemistries. But in the meantime, it pays for fire services to know how to tackle an electric vehicle fire once in a blue moon when it happens. And those firefighting techniques are being developed and they're becoming quite promising. But EV Fire Safe are the, the true experts on this one. But yeah, there have been some interesting um, interesting uh, bits of progress recently towards actually putting out an NMC electric vehicle fire quicker and using less water than you'd require for a petrol car fire. And I mean, you know, we go back to 2009 when the first cars, electric cars appeared on the market for consumers. <clears throat> this is not a long time in the in the annals of the auto industry. And we've we've made huge, huge progress with batteries, haven't we? And and how far is the solid state battery away? So the solid state battery, there's there's quite a few companies working on those. And actually, there's a few that have kind of sneakily made their way into production. So the so-called semi-solid state batteries yeah. that you can get as well, which is a kind of mm. you know compromise in a way, but still adds some useful features. So the Mercedes electric Bendy bus, uh, which is available in continental Europe, there is an optional long range battery, which is semi-solid state, but it takes longer to charge, not just because it's higher capacity, but the C rate, the maximum power it can take on versus its capacity is lower than the conventional lithium ion version. And just tell us, a solid state battery that's no electrolyte, it gives um, longer range, uh, no thermal runaway. Uh, Just go through the the, the, the advantages of solid state. Um, So if we have a a quick look at a conventional lithium ion battery so that we've got a a benchmark to compare with, we've got uh, your anode, which is your negative electrode, which has some means of storing lithium, normally graphite. So carbon. And then you've got your positive electrode, which is your your cathode, and that's normally some sort of lithium metal oxide. So NMC or or LFP. And the the issue with graphite is that um, it's quite bulky. You need six carbon atoms to store one lithium. The reason you can't use pure lithium is because when you pair all of that with a liquid electrolyte and a separator, just a kind of polymer separator, the lithium ions are not inclined to plate evenly back onto the anodes. So they create this kind of mountain range, which ends up creating little branch-like growths called dendrites of pure lithium metal, which eventually puncture that little flimsy polymer separator, touch the other electrode, the, the positive electrode, and that creates an internal short circuit that means that the cell very quickly discharges itself, even if you disconnect it from the vehicle or from whatever it's powering. And it just heats up and uh, you know, vents gas and, and catches fire, etc., or could catch fire, depending on the chemistry. So if you replace the liquid electrolyte and the polymer separator with a solid electrolyte, you vastly reduce the odds of that dendrite growth. And it means that you can remove the graphite 
in some of these configurations anyway, and you can use pure lithium. So that means that all of the negative electrode, all of the anode is taking place in that reaction. You know, the, it's, it's actually storing energy rather than storing the stuff that stores energy. So you've vastly improved the energy density, the amount of, um, of energy that you can squeeze in to a particular volume, which is very important for electric cars that have limited space for the battery. So yeah, that's the advantage of, of solid state. And as you rightly point out, um, the odds of that catching fire are greatly reduced because you've removed the flammable liquid and you've replaced it with a solid, which um, in some versions is a ceramic. So, you know, not particularly inclined to, to catching fire. But, you know, they are still uh, a while away from that kind of dream ultimate solid state cell being reality. There are lots of companies who are working very hard on this and there's lots of great progress being made. Blue Solutions, who've got that semi-solid state one that's available in the Mercedes buses, they are rumoured to be trying to make a faster charging version for electric cars. Um, and there's also the likes of QuantumScape, which is kind of synonymous with solid state battery development. And they've been making some good progress on their solid state cell. Occasionally, the stock market gets a bit spooked by the pace of that progress. In other words, they don't think it's fast enough. But from an electrochemical perspective, trust me, you want to get this right. They are making solid progress, no pun intended. But there's loads of other startups out there and very experienced companies who are um, working on this too. Pretty much all the big cell manufacturers, the big household names, but well, I say household, if you are an EV driver, household names, uh, you know, they, they've got their own solid state development programs or have investments in the likes of QuantumScape, these startups that are developing solid state. So right. yeah, late 2020s, I reckon, before we see them in EVs on the road though. But it's very important that we do this battery research and development because we've come so far and we could go even further. And here in the UK, and I'm a, a, a real advocate of this we've got this fabulous triangle of, of battery excellent haven't we with <coughs> excuse me warwick manufacturing group uk bic faraday institution you worked at wmg didn't you oh, and, yeah. and the, the electric car has spawned all this research and development there's billions and billions of dollars and pounds going into battery research and we've got as a country to really promote that haven't we and we have those skills and expertise here you know, just try and tell the listeners why that's so important for the general, you know, automotive industry and 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 the general kind of move of technology that 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 we have to invest in this R and D. Well, we do, and I think it's fair to say that we're doing quite a good job of investing at that very early stage of research and development. You mentioned WMG, and I can tell you now that that is just a kind of Willy Wonka's factory for any kind of electrochemist. It's this amazing facility with all the toys you could play yep. with. Yep. Uh, they can even test things to destruction. Um, yep. Yeah, they, they, they've got everything you can possibly want. And there's, there's actually a kind of rebel faction that's been set up across the road at Coventry University that's doing great work there as well. Um, but there's, there's many academic research groups across the UK coming up with amazing new cell chemistries, coming up with amazing new modelling for battery management systems, and also just you know, that, that kind of... Um, ecosystem. There's, there's a lot of cool work on electric motors too. This is valuable, but what we need to be doing, investing in is those companies who spin out from those research groups and who set up and, and try to make this at a mass produced scale. And we've seen too many times that the UK is brilliant at research, but rubbish at commercialization. We have the engineering talent, but the management and the lack of, of willingness of investors has let us down. It seems to be that if you have an amazing new idea and you want, say, 50 to 100,000 pounds to prove it at a tiny little lab scale, there's loads of investors willing to give you that money. If you've got a well-established product and you want, you know, a few hundred million or maybe a billion or two to build a gigafactory, the money is there from various investors and, and potentially from government support. It's that bit in the middle when you are the startup has proved the thing at a tiny little lab scale and you now want to build up to the stage where you can test it at a real world scale, you know, making a, a full electric vehicle battery pack out of this amazing new chemistry that you've developed, for example, and you're looking for, say, five to 10 million. There's no investment there. Despite the fact that we know that there are investors who are willing to invest hundreds of millions or even billions, those investors, my, my plea to you is if you don't start investing the kind of five to 10 million in these startups, you will run out of the 100 million to billion companies to invest in because everything, they will, these, those companies 
they will wither on the vine at the five to ten million stage. And we've seen that happen to Oxus, we've seen which had amazing lithium sulfur batteries, super lightweight. They were in the middle of building a scale up facility in Brazil that was going to be building packs for electric buses and trucks. And when they ran out of financial runway, we've seen it happen with Amity Power just recently. They were working on a sodium ion cell with Ferradian. Um, they had a couple of other chemistries that they were working on too. Um, that has, has fallen by the wayside. That was the UK's first ever battery factory. But um, the good news is that's now going to be making solid state cells from a Dutch startup. Uh, you know, we, we could easily, I mean, there, there's so many exciting UK battery startups who would do amazing work with that investment. And we absolutely need to be doing that because otherwise we will be net importers of this technology and we're not going to be benefiting directly. And that's huge for the automotive industry because if we have to import everything from overseas, then that's huge job losses. That's a huge economic drain. Bearing in mind that we once upon a time were a massive automotive powerhouse and when it comes to niche high performance vehicles, etc., we still are. I mean, Formula One, Formula E, for example, as well. But, you know, we, we could absolutely be doing mainstream electric automotive. And that's where the likes of the Tata Agritas Gigafactory uh, rumoured for Somerset, the expansion of Nissan Sunderland's uh, battery gigafactory, the, you know, the ill fate of the British fault site. Um, hopefully that will end up with uh, competent ownership and will be, will be built into a gigafactory. These are all important because I can tell you now that even if we end up oversupplying the number of cells that we end up producing, that if you have a look at the US and the EU and their own legislation about diversifying their supply chains away from China, so true. We, we could sell everything that we make. I know, I know, absolutely. So to any kind of investors or politicians listening, Ewan is absolutely making a very, very, very good point that we really do need to develop our battery skills, make them at scale and, you know, protect the auto industry and create this 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 hugely important for public health um, uh, energy transition. And ultimately, you know, the, the, the lessons we learn from, from batteries in EVs, we can transport to static energy storage, which will eventually, you know, power... Uh, not just towns, but hopefully all cities, and 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 balance the grid and 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 store all that renewable energy that we're we're, we're doing such a good job in creating. Very briefly before before we run out of time, and I know this is a difficult subject, um, so we must we must watch not making it too complicated. Tell me about sort of decoupling gas from electricity because we're not seeing that 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 cheap cost of renewables reflected in our bills. You're, you're quite expert on this, aren't you? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, I would bow down to the likes of Graham Cooper, formerly of National Grid, when it comes to these matters. But from, from what I've been doing in terms of my sleuthing, um, it's patently obvious that we could actually bring down our energy bills without any subsidies whatsoever. Um, so this would be an entirely a kind of reform of the electricity market in a way that benefits everybody. Why is that important? Well, obviously, you'll know the, the price of your own electricity bills at home. Anyone who's listening, um, they right. are you know two to three times the price that they were before uh, Putin invaded Ukraine, etc. And and obviously, like post post COVID as well, as the price of gas shot through the roof, uh, and that has taken the price of electricity with it, and that's affected industry too. I know for a fact that there are uh, actually like pretty big battery related projects that potentially could happen in the UK, but are not because people behind it, who've got the money to do this, by the way, are worried about the price of energy. Yeah. And that's this This is genuinely hampering industry now. It's taking the mick. Um, because, of course, without industry, there are less jobs. And without jobs, then you can't afford to pay your ridiculously high energy bills. Point is that um, at the moment, the way that the wholesale electricity market works is that various different generators, whether that's wind, solar, hydro, coal, gas, nuclear, etc., they all bid at half hourly windows to meet the demand of the grid that's forecast for that time. And it's the person or the, the company or the generator, I should say, that bids the highest price that sets the wholesale price that everyone else gets paid. So wind always bids pretty cheap because funnily enough, it's a very cheap energy source. Um, Nuclear is a wee bit more expensive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to what used to be one of the cheapest, but is now sky high for the reasons we've just mentioned, gas. Yes, gas yes. sets the price that everyone else gets paid. So as, as long as there's gas on the grid, then you end up with this horrific wholesale price. And it's just gas holding everyone to ransom. So what we could be doing is we could be splitting out the cost of gas 
from the cost of electricity. So gas could be paid whatever you know ransom price it's being paid or, or needs to be paid just now. And then the next highest price could set the wholesale price for everyone else. But that next highest price would be so much cheaper. So say the grid was 70% not gas and 30% gas, then it would be 30% times an extortionate wholesale price for gas plus 70% times a much less extortionate rate for everyone else equals your new wholesale electricity price. And that would bring down your costs considerably. I've done an episode of Plug Live Television with some nice wee infographics that explains it much more clearly. But genuinely, you could be looking at substantial tens upon tens of percent reduction in the cost of electricity prices without saying, oh, right, we're just not going to pay gas what it needs. No, we would still do that because it's not the fault of gas-fired power plants. It's the oil and gas extractors whose costs haven't changed one jot, but they're taking advantage of the wholesale market and being crazy high for gas right now. So they are laughing their way to the bank with these record profits and dividends, and they are laughing in your face. So we basically have found a way of at least making sure that we get the last laugh by being able to reduce our electricity tariffs, while still rewarding the likes of uh, wind farms and so on for bidding low, because inevitably there'll be another generator that will pay you know, that will bid higher than the cheapest wind farms, but the wind farm will still get paid that rate. But that remember what electricity prices were like in 2020, 2021? It'll be just like that for for them, I should say. You know, which is still good for development and so on. And it's good for you from the affordability of your bills. It wouldn't quite bring it back to 2020, 20, no, 21 levels, but it would knock a huge chunk off it. So, And also because gas, the cost of gas would remain the same. If you've got gas-fired central heating and so on, yes, you know that would still stay, stay the same price, but it would encourage um, households who can to switch towards heat pumps, etc. And it would also encourage developers to scrap gas-fired boilers for new developments, which is just ridiculous that some companies are still doing this and actually put in green heating systems, or here's a smart idea, enough insulation to actually do the job. Ewan, we could we could talk for hours on this uh, across a, a range of subjects, and I've, I've not even begun to tick all the questions I was going to ask you. So look, we've run out of time. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, just to recap, you know, batteries are not degrading. They can last up to 300,000 miles. Batteries are much less likely to catch fire than, than than combustion cars. And and we need to reform the electricity system for the benefits to the economy, to business and to public health. So look, um, just tell us how, how people can can understand more and 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 and, and learn more of your 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 sage advice. Um, tell us about Plug Live Television and, and and how to get in touch. Yeah, so Plug Live Television, which um, came about because people had really good questions about battery tech and EVs and, and quite often they just weren't getting the answers that they were looking for on panel sessions, etc. So I thought, here I am sitting with this breadth of information, uh, not just from the lab, but from actually driving these machines since 2009. So yeah, Plug Live Television is on YouTube. Um, and in fact, I've just launched uh, an exciting new kind of rebooted series. I've, I've teamed up with a, a familiar face to the channel, Mark Taylor Hankins. Um, and we've we've done some interesting kind of technical insight deep dives, including a, a, an interview with Simon Williams at the RAC just recently. So in, compare, in comparison to me with my shaky smartphone camera footage, it's a lot better, um, a lot better looking. But there's, yeah, as I say, loads of episodes with lots of um, useful infographics that explain how batteries work uh, and also kind of wider energy and EV related matters. You also find me on Twitter as well, of course, at 106 Ewan and also there's something that's spun out the back of uh, Plug Life Television is Plug Life Consulting. So if anyone's actually needing a team electric chemist to cover anything, whether it's technical, strategic or public outreach, and whether it's projects to do with battery tech, electric vehicles, charging infrastructure or static energy storage, I've done the lot. So, um, yeah, it's great being able to, to mix up the working week. I do miss the lab on occasion, uh, but I've still got very good friends who work there and I've always been kept up to date on the latest developments, which is great. But yeah, great to be able to help out as many of the exciting projects uh, as I have over the last couple of years. And I look forward to continuing that. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ewan McTurk, Britain's real expert on batteries. Thank you. Please support our Stop Burning Stuff Patreon and help us to tackle misinformation about electric vehicles and clean energy. Thank you, as always, for listening. You'll find any of the links we discussed in the show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, hearing all about batteries from Britain's best battery chemist, 
Ewan, please do subscribe or share with others. If you'd like to find out more about Stop Burning Stuff or help fund our fact-sharing mission, you can do so at patreon.com slash stopburningstuff. Thank you for listening.